I don't think it's possible to put into words just how truly horrific and terrifying the universe of Warhammer 40k truly is. It is a realm full of sadistic monsters, heretical cults, and dark eldritch gods. It is a galaxy where the human race fights a million battles across the stars every single day, and not in the hopes of making any form of advancement towards our glorious destiny, as that was the hopeful dream of a young species that was crushed long ago. Instead, we fight on, only to cling to existence for but a few more centuries. The void of space, the dark places between stars, these are the hunting grounds of the alien, the mutant, and the heretic. Those who lurk in every shadow and desire only to consume the flesh of the Emperor's faithful. This is a brutal universe. It's unforgiving and uncaring. And it is rife with material to write some truly spectacular spooky stories. Now, unfortunately, most of these tales are told from the perspective of eight-foot-tall demigods clad in ceramite power armor. So it's a little difficult to put ourselves in their shoes and really feel fear for our main characters. The Watcher in the Rain was one of the early entries into the Warhammer horror line, a project that was introduced by the Black Library a few years ago. Now, this project's goal was to shed some of that figurative light on the darkest corners of this universe. The smaller, more macabre stories that often get overshadowed by the never-ending war that plagues the galaxy. The story sees an unlikely pair being forced to rely on one another for survival as they attempt to escape a drowning world. All the while, someone or something is stalking them in the darkness, something so evil and terrible that to look upon it is to risk losing yourself to the darkness forever. It's an excellent story, one that I think doesn't really get nearly as much credit as it deserves, one with an absolutely perfect ending. So gather round, my friends, and let's dive into the chilling tale of the Watcher in the Rain. But before we get into that, a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, and then we're gonna dive headfirst into the grimdark. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends has taken over, and gaming will never be the same again. Raid is the first game to bring a true console-level experience to your phone. Explore millions of champion combinations and master countless tactics as you take on raid bosses, dungeon runs, campaign battles, and PvP arena matches. With hundreds of artifacts to equip on over 600 champions, you can build your team and raid your way. My favorite part about Raid has gotta be just how unique all of the champions are, and how much synergy exists between all of them. Recently, I have been really loving the Catacomb Counselor, as his ultimate ability is called Army of Death that teams up with two or three random allies to attack a single target. This move is amazing in boss battles, as having three of your champions get an extra attack for free not only does a ton of damage, but can also reapply any of their debuffs. There's never been a better time to get started in Raid, and its developers have an amazing gift for my viewers. Regardless if you're a new player or a veteran, if you use the promo code DKRISES, you'll get a bunch of free items that will instantly level up your strongest champions all the way to level 50, 5-star ascension. You'll be able to use the promo code till October 25th, so don't sleep on it. But if you're a brand new player, there's even more. Click the link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen and you'll get a unique bonus worth $30. We're talking a free epic champion, Aina, 200k silver, one energy refill, one XP boost, and one ancient shard. So you can summon some awesome champions as soon as you get into the game. All of this treasure will be waiting for you right here. Thanks again to the awesome people over at Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. And with that out of the way, let's get into the grimdark. Our story begins on the administratum world known as K4. There has been constant rainfall and other brutal weather conditions for eight weeks straight. This is due to a massive warp storm that is rolling into this section of space. The rain is drowning the city out in a flood of biblical proportions, but this pales in comparison to the danger presented by the warp storm itself, as it will inevitably cut the planet off from the rest of the Imperium for hundreds, if not thousands of years. This is a critical situation and a death sentence to anyone still planet side when the storm finally engulfs this world. A planet wide evacuation has begun, and this is where we meet one of our main characters, a young woman dressed in the robes of one of the world's many scribes. The evacuation at this point has been going on for several weeks, but all of a sudden, in this final stretch, the Planetary Defense Force has been deployed to oversee the evacuation. This doesn't really make a lot of sense, as it's an emergency situation. It's almost like they're expecting trouble, like they're looking for someone. The woman is accompanying an old man, a member of the upper echelons of the Administratum. 
Before the evacuation, the two had never actually met before, but are making small talk on the way to the docking bay. He turns to her and notes that she's wearing the robes of a scribe, but he had never seen her before, and he asks her what department she belongs to. The woman seems skittish and dodges the question through a mixture of redirecting questions about himself and a generous helping of sycophantic flattery. All too keen to talk about the great work that he does, he abandons his previous line of questioning. He begins to boast of his proud 37 years of faithful service when something catches his eye. Across the way, in one of the many spires, he swore he could see someone, a shadowy figure staring out of one of its many windows looking directly at him. He tells her to look, there's somebody still inside one of those buildings, that someone must have been left behind. The woman looks generally in that direction, but says she can't see anything, and that he must be mistaken. When the pair finally makes it up to the ship, there's a guard that demands that they each give a blood sample. Now the old man tells the guard that they have left someone behind. On the 14th floor of the building across the way, he definitely saw somebody. The guard says that those buildings were evacuated and bolted up weeks ago, that there was definitely no one inside and he must be mistaken. The old man says he knows what he saw, but the guard is having none of it. He demands they both present their arms for a blood sample. The old man, high on the woman's previous flattery, claims that he's much too important to submit to the guard's demands. The guard responds by breaking his nose, restraining him, and making a servo skull take the sample by force. The servo skull clatters and chimes, but says that the man is free to go. But when the guard turned to take the girl's sample, she had vanished. The guard demands the old man tell him who she was and where she went, but he says he had never seen her before this moment. The guard pushes the man in the direction of the ship and opens a Vox channel to his other team members. He tells them a suspicious female had fled the checkpoint and to deploy all servo skulls to scan the area and track her down. We meet back up with the woman who has fled into one of the many scriptorium towers. She mumbles to herself, obviously in a state of panic, as she failed to get aboard the ship and she knows she doesn't have a lot of time before she will inevitably be left behind. She talks to herself, saying something about printing a sacred warrant of conveyance, that she just has to tell them that she's working for the labor corps. If they think she's working for a different tower, they might let her through. Now clearly, we as the audience can see that something is definitely wrong, that this woman may not be who she claims to be. She makes her way through the tower, feeling her way in the dark. It's a difficult journey, but she's worked in this tower her entire life and trusts her intuition to get her to the generator. When she finally arrives, her hope crumbles to despair. The generator had been deactivated and there was no way to turn it back on. In a panic, she starts scrambling through any of the scrolls available, but it's dark and she can't read them. She claims she'll just grab as many of them as she can and make her way back out, that there had to be something in one of them that she could use. She suddenly realizes that she isn't alone, that there was something in here with her, a figure in the darkness. All sound suddenly vanishes from the room. She then hears a chilling, ethereal voice coming from directly behind her. Will you see me? I, I see nothing. I'm right here. Turn and look at me. I won't. I see me. I won't. She screams and sobs. It's in this moment that interrogator, Stefan Crucius, favorite apprentice of the great inquisitor Aatrox, finds her and tells her to stand down. He has a gun drawn and it's pointed directly at her. Whatever the thing was, it's gone for now. He demands to know what she's doing here and she quickly and shakily tells him that she had forgotten her seal of exodus, that that was all and there was no need for him to be pointing a gun at her. He strikes her across the face and forces her to the ground before cuffing her. He then commands his servo skull to take a blood sample. She protests nervously, saying that there was no need for that, that she is Adepta Serena Malice. He laughs and says that was nothing but an alias, one that she had been operating under for over a year, and her real name was Greta Verne, which is confirmed by the chiming servo skull. He says that she was responsible for the loss of over a thousand Imperial lives and asks her if she denies this. The man's words were true. She had been on the run for some time now, and through tear-filled eyes, she looked at him and says it was an accident. Somebody finally discovering her secret is terrifying, but it's almost like a huge weight had been lifted off her shoulders. She tells him that she wishes to make a full confession. He calls her a heretic and says that he has already interrogated other members of her cabal, but none of them had given up her master and that he would get the answers he needed out of her through force if necessary. Greta seems incredibly confused by this, she pleads with him, saying that there has to be some mistake. 
Now, his words were true, but it was just an accident, one that was solely her fault. There was no great cult, no secret shadowy master. It was just her. She said she would explain everything to him, that she had worked for the administratum her entire life, that she is and had always been loyal. He drags her to her feet and keeps his firearm trained on her. He says, I don't make mistakes, heretic. Now move. As they walk back out of the tower, he prods her with questions. Who was her master? How many other agents were there? How many of them were already aboard the ships? She said that he had it all wrong, that all that happened was she misfiled a casket of requisition scrolls. It was the only mistake that she had made in her entire life. But in a panic, she knew what could happen to her, what the Imperium did to those that made mistakes. So she accessed the databanks and took an alias. But that was the extent of her crimes. The interrogator tells her that the batch of scrolls she had misfiled had caused a shipment of faulty respirators to be sent to guardsmen stationed on a toxic death world. That incorrect ammunition had been sent to another, its recipients getting slaughtered by the enemy. That she had knowingly mislaid a year of food supplies to be sent to a third. That the men that didn't starve to death had to be executed for cannibalism. This was no accident. It was an act of malicious sabotage. He drags her back through the tower, claiming that when they get back to the ship, he would use every ounce of his skill to extract a confession from her. When they finally make it all the way back to the door, something was wrong. The interrogator had left it open, but it was now shut. He tried as hard as he could, but he couldn't get it to move. He turns to the woman and demands to know where her partners are and how many other cultists were in this building. Surely it was them who had locked them inside. She tells him once again that she has no idea what he's talking about. It's just then that the pair overhear on the loudspeakers that the ships will be departing in 10 minutes. Frantically, Crucius slams himself into the door, trying to get it open. The woman tells him to take off the cuffs and let her help him. He tells her there's no chance of that, heretic, and orders his servo skull to use its las cutter to sever the lock. But it doesn't respond. He asks the servo skull, what are you waiting for? There's an eerie silence, and then the skull starts stuttering. Will you, will you, will you, will you see me? Will you see me? Will you see me? Crucius' mind starts to go blank as he's drawn in by the servo skull's chanting. And the next thing he knows, he's on the ground, the woman kicking him, telling him to get up, that he's been out for over 10 minutes and the ships were leaving. He slams back into the door and finally gets it open, and the pair run back to the launch bay, but the ships are gone. He opens his Vox to hail the ships, but there's nothing but static. They were too late. Greta sobs, saying if he had just uncuffed her when she asked, they could have opened the door together and made it back. He silences her and says that there are most likely smaller vessels still within the spire, most likely in the cargo bay. And if she was a scribe like she claimed to be, then she would be able to lead the way to one of those ships. The pair begin their journey back into the abandoned city, desperately seeking a way off of this doomed world. The storm was getting stronger and more dangerous with every passing minute. And always just out of the corner of Croesus's eye, he saw something, or someone, stalking them through the rain. He tells her that, don't think for a moment, I didn't see the figure watching us on the platform. One of your partners, I assume. He's been watching us since the shuttle left, and you will tell me how many of your friends are still here. Greta looks away and tells him, I don't know what you mean. He says, do not lie to me. Every denial will earn you another minute in my chair, every second of which will be an eternity of agony. She tells him to listen very carefully. There is nothing there. It is just shadows in the rain. It's just then that he hears an ethereal voice in his ear. I'm right here. He panics and wheels around, drawing his pistol and firing las bolts off in the direction of the voice. She pleads with him to stop, telling him there is nothing there, just shadows in the rain. The interrogator is furious. He grabs and shakes her. That was no shadow. It was right here. You will explain yourself. You saw what I saw, a figure standing in the rain, watching, watching like it was waiting for something. She's screaming now over the sounds of the storm. You saw nothing. The pair of them needed to focus in order to reach the cargo bay before the flood claimed it and any chance they had of escape. Crozius tells her that this isn't over and this adventure will end in her confession. The pair make it back inside and journey through the spire. The path is daunting a seemingly infinite amount of hallways and corridors, with scrolls stacked as high as the eye could see, an endless maze of monotony and bureaucracy, a journey that would surely drive the uninitiated mad. But Greta claims this is just another day in the life for a scribe.
Same pools of parchment demanding the same tasks, day after day, half blind from squinting in the lamplight, a thousand quills scratching in the dark. No one speaks, just murmurs of prayers to keep everyone from going mad, the weeks bleeding into years. Greta is suddenly interrupted by the sounds of screaming three levels down. There's an asylum down there where scribes that have been driven mad through their work are sent away, left to fester and rot by the same Imperium they had dedicated their lives to. The interrogator claims that it is very likely that all of the cells have been open. Greta seems incredibly disturbed by the fact that all of them were simply left behind to die. While Crucius, rather dismissively, states that the Imperium will endure without the contribution of a few broken-minded adepts. Taken aback by the sheer callousness of the statement, Greta says, broken by their servitude to the Imperium, left to fester in their cells for decades, waiting for some prefix to show up and decide what should be done with them. Do you have any idea how many days I spent being absolutely certain that one day I would be among them? He shoves her and tells her to move. He laughingly says, this abandoned city is getting rather crowded. What with the legion of howling lunatics and your other cult members lurking in the dark. Greta has had about enough. She angrily says, oh, you're absolutely right. I have an army of followers lurking in the shadows. Every one of them here for the honor of killing you. That's what you want to hear, isn't it? Or perhaps is it that you can't face the fact that you're here because of a banal mistake by a banal civilian? He stares daggers at her. You will be silent. I am so sorry. I am not the monster you hope to find. Crucius grabs her by the throat and starts choking her. Let's say, for a moment, I believe you, that you are indeed working alone. Then tell me who it is that is following us. I saw it just now. Hiding behind a curtain of water, I know you know what it is, so tell me. Speak. It's just then that the floor completely gives way under the massive amount of water that has been flooding it. They both fall down several levels and end up having to work together to find stable ground. So Crucius deactivates her servo cuffs remotely. As if he didn't, the two of them surely would have plummeted to their deaths. Once the two of them climb back up, they begin to discuss what to do next and how to reach their destination, when they suddenly realize that their only path forward will take them through the asylum. Crucius is against this, but Greta says they don't really have much of a choice, and whether or not they like it, they are both partners in doom now. The lunatic asylum is cold and dark. It is a terrifying place that her pair attempts to move through as quickly and quietly as possible, and most of the inmates have gathered in a central room and are chanting a very strange hymn. Now, chanting hymns like this is not uncommon within the administratum, but even though Greta can't quite make out the words, this is unlike any hymn she's ever heard before. They round the corner into a clearing, one that does have a small amount of illumination coming through the windows, but what's on the other side of them is chilling. This level is completely underwater. Greta states that they have to get out of here as quickly as possible, that that glass won't hold the flood back forever. It's just then that they hear the speaking of one of the inmates, coming from a surveillance pulpit a level above them. Who's up next, he shouts. I haven't got all day. Crucius draws his gun, but Greta puts her hand on it and says, just wait, let me talk to him. She says, good evening, my lord. Forgive me, I, I didn't see you up there. I see from your robes that you are from the Catalogica division. I was wondering if you could tell me the way to the cargo bay? He looks at her and responds, My dear scribe, of course I can do that. I have cataloged every single thing in this department for decades. He tells her, Your request has been recorded, and you shall receive your directions in three to twelve months. Next! Greta says, Well, we're in a bit of a hurry. Could you just tell us the way? Tell you? Tell you? This is the administratum. We do not traffic in the treachery of speech, girl. Only bonds. Bonds of ink and parchment. Unbreakable. We shackle the Imperium of Man to its great and glorious purpose. Purity through procedure. Crucius puts his hand on Greta's shoulder. We're leaving, he says. They can hear the chanting of the other inmates getting closer and closer, beginning to surround them. The man on the pulpit says, Perhaps we could process your request manually. Greta says, well, so you can show us the way out. Of course, I will take you to the cargo bay myself, just as soon as you are correctly processed. The inmates have now completely surrounded them. He descends down to the same level they are on. My loyal apprentice wanted to leave here as well, 
Just last week, in fact. Well, she begged me to make an exception. Sadly, I am bound to honor procedure. Look here, he says, and opens a gate nearby. What they see is a truly grisly and horrific sight. Here I have her liver, teeth, eyes, all tagged, cataloged, and accounted for. The man pulls out a knife. Which one of you would like to be processed first? Crucius fires his last pistol into him and tells Greta to run for the stairs. The wounded man shouts back to them that the storm has come and with it comes the Watcher, the Watcher in the rain. Crucius stops and turns back to the wounded man. He demands that he tell him everything he knows about this Watcher. So you've seen him, haven't you, boy? Heard his call? You must answer it, as have we. Greta grabs his shoulder. This man is insane. Don't listen to him. The Watcher brings the rain that washes away our delusions. The cult keeps chanting louder and louder, saying, we see him, we see him, we see him. Crucius starts to lose it again, everything going blurry. Greta's voice starts to sound more and more distant. She's shaking him, telling him to wake up, not to look at it. They can both feel the Watcher's presence getting closer and closer. So you refuse his call. <laughs> Very well. You don't have the strength to face the truth. You may go. You'll find the cargo bay through the eastern exit at the end of the corridor. But your friend must stay. He can go once he sees who he truly is. She frantically begins to shake him again. Wake up. None of what you're seeing is real. And then we as the audience get to see what he sees. Crucius is having a flashback to the days of his training under Inquisitor Aatrox. He's in a medical facility, IVs trailing out of his arms. And over a Vox channel, his mentor is telling him to wake up. He's asking Crucius to recount recent events and tell him how he ended up here. We then learn a little bit about his backstory. Apparently, early in his career, the Inquisitor that he worked under had deployed him to seek out a woman expected of treason. And that once Crucius had finally located her, he interrogated her for the standard six days straight. But due to a previous firefight he was in with the gang members protecting this woman, his interrogator tool set had been lost. That he had to improvise with whatever he could find pipes, broken shards of glass, whatever he needed to extract the truth from the condemned. It is then revealed to us, the audience, that this woman was his own mother and that the Inquisitor had known this before sending him on this mission. Even more disturbing, it is revealed that she was innocent. The Inquisitor asked Crucius over the Vox, what did it feel like to do that to someone who loved you? Crucius tells him that it was like polishing his boots or dressing his uniform, that it didn't make him feel anything at all. Obviously pleased with the answer, the Inquisitor tells Crucius that their duty dismisses them from feelings and emotions, that through procedure, they will achieve purity. He demands he recite a passage from their handbook, and Crucius complies. To conquer the monstrous, we must then be yet more monstrous, for we are at war with a galaxy of horrors, with the Xenos, the heretics, the abominations of the warp, all who seek to threaten the righteous destiny of the Imperium of Man. A single drop of mercy will cost us oceans of innocent blood. We cannot afford pity. The Inquisitor tells him over the Vox that he must understand the importance of feeling nothing, that it is for his own protection. For to truly understand what he has become, the monster that the Imperium has made him into, to comprehend the moral gravity of the atrocities you are compelled to commit, such a revelation would be enough to drive a man of reason irretrievably insane. The vision suddenly ends with Greta striking him. Wake up. If I can't wake you, Crucius, I will damn well carry you out of here. The crazy man from before says, if she will not leave alone, then you will be processed together. The inmates descend on the pair as they make for the stairs and using Crucius's gun, she shoots out the glass, the chamber flooding and the water quickly chasing after them up the stairs. They managed to get on the other side of the door before slamming it, the cold, icy water behind them claiming all of the inmates. They frantically make their way towards the cargo bay. Crucius is obviously shaken and tells her he saw something, that he saw one of his worst memories. She tells him it wasn't real. None of that was real. You have to keep moving. As the pair makes its way, they hear the telltale signs of the Watcher following them, always just out of sight. They finally make it to the cargo bay. It isn't flooded, but it's getting close. Crucius stops her and says, back there, what was that? What happened to me? She says, ignore it. It's not important right now. 
which one of these ships do we take? There's all different types, but I don't know how to fly any of them. I need you to focus. He doesn't respond. And when she turns back to him, he's staring off into the distance behind her. A look of terror crosses over Crucius' face. The Watcher. It's she strikes him and tells him to get a hold of himself. It's standing right behind you. No, it is not. It is. It's right there. I can see it. It wants you to turn around. I will not. Look at me. We need to get on one of these ships. Any one of them. We need to get out of here before we're trapped forever. You will tell me what it is. I will not move a muscle towards those ships until you tell me, adept. If I am going to go mad, I will know the reason. What is it? She draws a deep breath. I don't know. I first saw it about a year ago. Right around the time that the warp storms were first detected. I don't know what it is. But it seems to get stronger the more attention you give it. The more you admit it's there. You have to tell yourself it's nothing. That it's not there. It wants you to see it. It wants you to see what it is. To see what you are. All of the evil you have ever done. It's, it's like a mirror reflecting what you truly are. You want to look. You want to know, but you can't. You have to ignore it. If you see it, it will take you. It will take you away. Crucius looks at her. Adept, I am a monster. I understand why it wants me, but what does it want with you? Their conversation is interrupted by a massive strike of lightning nearby. Greta says, we don't have time for this. We're not safe here. We have to move. The pair manage to make it onto one of the cargo ships and escape, or so they think, as the interrogator once again comes face to face with the Watcher, reflected in the rain, pouring down the windshield. He starts to veer left and right, clipping the wings against the building. Through clenched teeth, he sobs and says, Oh, mother, I am so sorry. I am so sorry for what I did. Greta grabs a hold of the steering wheel and manages to keep the ship steady as they make it into the upper atmosphere. Once they make it into space, she grabs his hand and calms him down and tells him whatever the thing was, it's gone. They left it behind. There's nothing else out here. It's just stars in space now. She manages to calm him down, and he gets up to check to see if they have enough rations for their journey. They won't be able to contact another ship right away, and it will take over a month for them to reach the next docking station. Everything seems like it may have actually worked out for them. They've escaped the planet and whatever the thing in the rain was. And that's when he hears his mother's voice coming from outside the ship, knocking on the side paneling. Crucius immediately slips back into his madness and attempts to open the manual override door. Greta begs him to get a hold of himself, that it isn't real, that he has to shut it out. He grabs a hold of the door's latch and says, I'm coming, mother, and Greta shoots him in the leg. He screams in pain, but it seems to have done the trick. He manages to come to. He tells her, you could have gotten through to me without shooting me. And then she shoots him again, and again. Crucius shrieks in pain and shock, but then his next words are rather surprising. He says, I get it now, and honestly, I would have done the exact same thing if I was in an interrogator's possession. Even after everything they've been through, Crucius realizes that, at his core, he's a monster, and that she's just a scared scribe. Any sane person that had an opportunity like that to get away from their captor would have done the exact same thing. She's standing over him, keeping the gun drawn on him. He puts his hand up to tell her to wait. Before she finishes him off, let him do just one more thing. And he pulls a Vox recorder out of his coat. He records a message to his master, Inquisitor Aatrox, saying that he absolves Greta of all crime, that the error was traced back to her by mistake, and she is innocent of all charges, that he received these injuries from the lunatics in the tower. He puts the recorder away and asks her to spare him this indignity and to finish it, that he forgives her and he understands why she did what she did, that after everything they had been through, he knows that she is innocent. A vicious smile plays across Greta's face, and she says, but you still haven't heard my confession. She reveals to him that the misfiling was no accident, that she had done it on purpose, and it wasn't the first time either, that she had done this four to six times a day for the last year. She had killed an inconceivable amount of people, billions more than even the Imperium's most intrepid warriors, and she did it all without having ever left her desk. She tells him that she had told him the truth. The first time was an accident, and when she realized her mistake, she had a complete breakdown. She knew what the Imperium would do to her if they ever found out, and in a panic, she looked into the repercussions of her mistake. She discovered that she had caused 84 casualties. So she took an alias, 
but she figured that wouldn't be enough and that she would eventually be found. But as time went on, that never happened. No one even seemed to notice. There were so many millions of miles of red tape and conflicting bureaucratic chambers that any mistake would either go unnoticed or completely lost in the system. She kept thinking back to that moment about how much damage she had caused with but the stroke of a pen. For the first time in her life, she felt like she had a sense of control and she desperately hungered for that feeling once again. She tried to ignore it, of course, but eventually she gave in to it and misfiled another casket. And then she did it again and again. She felt like she had finally woken up, that when she looked around the scriptorium that she had spent her entire life in, she saw nothing but a tomb, one that her and all of the other scribes had been locked away in. She didn't see people, but corpses, pale, wretched, withered things, typing away their entire lives, toiling in purgatory. When you worked for the administratum as long as she had, you knew exactly what stamps to add and which safeguards to bypass. A batch of faulty grenades here, a shortage of vehicle fuel there, not enough to alert anybody, just enough to give the troops a disadvantage. Nothing that couldn't be put down to the efforts of the enemy. But eventually, she had to get more creative. She calculated food supplies that would spoil by the time they arrived on the front, or redirected requests for vehicles and equipment to bastions that were already under siege. As she confesses to him, the more manic and unhinged she becomes. She laughs about the soldiers that had been executed for cannibalism because of her. What a poetic thought, the Imperium eating itself. She says, you think I'm mad, don't you? Like the lunatics back in the spire. I'm not mad. Whatever I am, it is what the Imperium made me into. At this point, Crucius has passed out. He's lying on the floor, not moving. So she props him back up. She's not done confessing. She said she refuses to look at the Watcher. She won't do it because she knows what she'll see. The billions that she has killed out there floating in space, frozen, their faces blue, a galaxy of the dead. And she won't look at them. Go ahead and ask me why, she says. I need somebody to ask me why. And I, I need to tell you that our world is broken. The Imperium has blinded us with faith, broken our minds, and stopped us from seeing the ruin that it truly is. That's why I had to do this. It's why I have to keep doing this. I have to do all I can to thwart the Imperium, to stop it from making more monsters like us. It's just then that their ship receives a hail from a nearby military vessel, asking if anyone was alive in there. She couldn't believe it. They had been found already? What an unbelievable stroke of luck. She looks down at Crucius's corpse and tells him, thank you for listening to me. She hails the ship back and they ask her to identify herself. She says that she's adept Greta Vern, that she is on an Exodus shuttle from Imperial World K4, that the pilot was interrogator Crucius, but he died to his injuries. The scene shifts to the other ship and the members of the Militarum on board are discussing what to do. The captain tells the man at the Vox to bring her aboard. The man looks down at his feet and says, this isn't right. The captain tells him that they have another several standard weeks before they reach port, and the relay officer reminds him that when they get there, they will be executed. The captain says that it wasn't their fault that some fool in the Minotaurum gave them nothing but rotten food to get them through a 10-week voyage. They contact her again and say that they're going to be bringing her aboard, and she says, oh god, Emperor, thank you. The captain tells the soldier, we'll do this quick, she needn't suffer. Just don't let anybody see you getting the bodies to the kitchen. The story ends with her saying praise the Imperium over a staticky Vox channel.